so much to, for coming to our talk today and for finding the T1 building. I'm looking at this sea of wonderful people. I'm really glad that we did move it over here because we wouldn't have fit in the main building. So um, happy to see everybody. So this is a talk that is uh, sponsored by Humanities Montana. So I encourage everyone to go on their website and find out more about Humanities Montana programs. Um, I will introduce our speaker. Um, this is Carl Davis. He's a retired Forest Service archeologist and an author. And he will be telling us about 6,600 generations, um, the indigenous archeology span of Montana. Um, I'll just pass it over to you and I'll be your button pusher. Oh, I forgot, there is a sign-in sheet going around. That's mostly just for Humanities Montana so I can count how many folks there are. But if you do want to sign up for the newsletter from the museum, please feel free. We like to do fun programs and we'd like to hear from everybody. Oh, mind if I have my gem beam up here? <laughs> I've got it, I've got it hidden. Yeah, we're going to be talking about the Ice Age, and everybody's wearing their coats today, so everybody's prepared. Um, I don't know if, is this on? I'm supposed to, okay. So that'll record for MCAT. Okay. And I'm sorry, guys, we don't have a good PA system in here, so Carl's just going to have to use a big teacher voice. And then I will send out, I'll share the link for anybody who signs up to the MCAT um, recording when it's done. So if you want to hear it again, you can hear Carl again. Great, and I do speak quietly, I'm told, and so wave your hand if you can't hear. Um, yeah, thanks for everybody coming out. Uh, after this last couple of weeks, you never knew, you know, getting out and about what this weekend was going to bring, but at least it brought a little more gentle weather, encouraged people to come out. So thanks very much. Um, I'm a, for, a retired archaeologist with the Forest Service. Um, I've been in the field for lots and lots of years, and I continue, although I'm tri uh, retired, I continue to um, do these talks and publish and write about the indigenous history of Montana. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is give a really, um, uh-oh, I'm going to give a snapshot of what the archaeological record of Montana looks like and what it tells us about the first peoples that lived here thousands and hundreds of years ago. I'm speaking from the point of view of an archaeologist practicing the methodology of archaeology, and I don't deign to speak for tribal people about their history, about their perspectives on the indigenous record. Um, you know, I'm not empowered, don't have that knowledge to do so. So I'm really talking from the point of view of an archaeological, with an archaeological perspective. Yet fortunately, I have many tribal friends and peers that are in archaeology now and in cultural resource management or historic preservation. And so those sort of this old, school archaeological record is at long last, and I mean at long last, being interwoven with the tribal perspective and ideas and so forth. So, you know, this is just me talking, trying to get the word out that Montana has a deep and wonderful history. Okay. So to, to sort of to start things off, um, one of the reasons that I um, am out here today is I really feel like this indigenous record is not appreciated, and it's not appreciated or understood for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first reason is most of our history begins with Christopher Columbus or the arrival of Europeans, and that's where the narrative started. And I see a lot of sort of gray hair in this room, and I can attest that <laughs> When we went to school, this is where the world began, and um, Native Americans were treated as a backdrop to that indigenous history, bit players, if you will. So, you know, we haven't been taught in school to appreciate the depth of the human occupation of North and South America. Um, that's changing. There's lots of school courses now that are really working. We have Indian Education for All and programs that are attempting to bridge the gap between Euro-American history and this deep indigenous history. 
but for most of us, we've had very little exposure. I grew up in Dillon, Montana. My mom lived on the Navajo Reservation. I was exposed to indigenous archaeology and anthropology and tribal peoples early on. But I couldn't get the questions that I had about all these arrowheads and these teepee rings and teepee poles that I was observing when we were hunting and hiking around southwestern Montana. And it literally took me to go to college to take this obscure course called North American Indians to actually get the answers to the questions that I'd been asking for about this high. Which brings me to this depiction. Most of us, at least of our age, my age, our exposure to archaeology, indigenous archaeology, was through um, arrowhead collections, relic collectors, and so on. And on one hand, that where there was a nexus for people like me and other archaeologists to move on and say there's got to be more to this. But our, um, a lot of our exposure has been through artifacts and artifact collections. And finally, this quote by a senator who will remain nameless about, again, this attitude that Native American history is, uh, is marginal, peripheral, uh, whatever. And uh, you know, it's an outwardly awkward quote, but I would guess that a lot of Americans deep down sort of feel this way about Native Amer American history because they haven't really been exposed to it in a meaningful way. If you grew up as a school kid in Iceland, in Norway, in Botswana, wherever, you would be exposed to what the quote Stone Age is or what the indigenous people, whether you had any ethnic or genetic connection to those people, that is part of school curriculum. But you know, unless you have a particularly interested teacher, um, you don't really get this kind of exposure. So I'll quit dwelling on this, but this is the reason I'm pretty much standing up here today talking about this stuff when I could be watching a football game. <laughs> OK. So what really happened is, um, although archaeology was done under certain acts and so on to, uh, during the reservoir salvage in the 1950s, where these big reservoirs were going in, some archaeology was done. But it wasn't until the tumultuous 1960s that laws were passed that recognized that indigenous archaeology and ancient history is as important to the national narrative as this Eurocentric one. And so that established a lot of programs in federal and state governments. We call them cultural resource management. But, uh, and a lot of archaeologists like me and historians were hired to go out and see what was out on those landscapes. And if they were being um, affected by projects to figure out how significant they were and if we could do something to protect them. Um, science improved from these kind of rack, ramshackle days of the 1930s and 40s. If you go to Pictograph Cave, which if you've never been there, you should definitely go. It's one of the few archaeological sites dedicated to the public for public interpretation. It's a wonderful site. But WPA people, kids basically, men and women to some extent, um, participated in projects to keep them busy and they dug up sites all over the place. And the archaeology wasn't done very well, not to the precise standards of today. And then finally, public education has really been a big part of the, what archaeologists do, what I'm doing today, what my peers and friends do all the time too. And so now we're really at a place where we can actually talk about the indigenous archaeology and why it's important. Okay. Uh-oh, a chart. Oh my God. Um, I won't bore you with this, but you know, um, everything boils down to climate when you talk about humankind, how we respond, how we live in the climates, how we live in ever-changing climates. And I won't get into the detail, but to set the stage, I want to um, make sure that you understand we're talking about the last 2.5 million years, which is called um, the, it's the, the Pleistocene, or, and during that period there were four different major periods of glaciation where these big polar ice cap in both the North and South Pole grew because the 
conditions on planet Earth changed and the glaciers expanded. And how do those conditions change? They change because the, the Earth's orbital geometry changed, its route around the sun, its tilt, its wobble. And when those things work together, they affect the amount of solar radiation that reaches the planet. And when there's not a lot of solar radiation or as much at northern latitudes, ice sheets grow on both the North and South Pole. And then they inch forward and they inch forward and over time there are these massive, massive mile high things out on the landscape. So we're going to talk initially about the last um, 25, or, well actually about 85,000 years, which we call the Pleistocene. I guess I could use my pointer. Oh, now I look really <laughs> professional. And <laughs> This, and then 11,000 years ago, we go into a period of glacial retreat called the Holocene. And the Holocene has a lot of blips, climatic blips and so on. But this is the present geological epoch that we're now in. So we're going to start the Pleistocene through the Holocene. Of course, some people feel like we're in the Anthropocene, a new name because of, for the first time on planet Earth, humankind has had a, such a profound effect on the geological processes of this planet that um, it's worthy of a different name. But we won't get into those discussions now. Okay. So during the Pleistocene, the last um, episode was called the Wisconsin. And ice sheets grew and covered all of Canada, come, came down into the northern tier of the United States. It was a cold, chilly place. The same in Europe. And ancient peoples um, all across the, the world living at northern latitudes um, lived in what were essentially ice age conditions. Now that doesn't mean it was cold all the year round. They had spring, summers, and falls. But summer was chilly and short. And winters were really cold and long. And they survived by hunting and gathering. And what they depended on was a lot of large Pleistocene animals like woolly mammoths and um, ancient, uh, ancient um, forms of bison and so on. Um, they also had to contend with ferocious um, predators like the saber-toothed cat, the dire wolf. And this, I can't quite remember the name of this grizzly bear, but you wouldn't want to meet him if you ran into him. So these people lived, this is a winter depiction, but they were very attuned to the climate and very cold, cold weather conditions. And these are the conditions in which North American Indian peoples, as I will talk about in the next slide, came across to inhabit um, the New World. Now, if you go to France, if you're ever in France, I encourage you to go to a place called the Dordogne, which is the region of France where the clan of the cave bear, where all that sex happened, um, was um, in that region. But they have wonderful, wonderful rock art. Um, you can go down in caverns, and you can really appreciate this rich life that Pleistocene peoples lived. And everybody here in this room has the DNA of Pleistocene peoples. I don't care what your ethnicity is, uh, what language you speak. We all are born out of this upper Paleolithic foundation that these people were able to survive. And I often think, what if they hadn't survived? We wouldn't be sitting here today. OK. So what happened if you picture this Ice Age condition where you have these hunters and gatherer groups? Um, how this all really began is humankind, people that look like just like you and me, evolved in Africa some 200 to 300,000 years ago. And there were all kinds of different populations that were sort of look like us, kind of like us, but um, our human species um, became the dominant species on the planet Earth. And they moved out of Africa in search of game, in search of food, in search of God knows what, and moved out into Europe and across into Siberia on this really long ancient journey. And this occurred during the Ice Age and sort of slightly warming periods and cold periods. 
Now, earlier fossil of ancient peoples had moved out of Africa, the famous Homo erectus, and they moved out of Africa a million and a half years ago. The Neanderthals, um, this cute little Neanderthal kid here, um, they um, evolved um, much uh, earlier in time. And the interesting thing about Neanderthals, they're all over the paper. Uh, you know, the human species had sex with Neanderthals. All of us have about one to four, well, two to four percent of Neanderthal uh, genetics in our genome. So these relatives of ours who were always depicted, uh, depicted as very brutal kind of guys. In fact, when our species moved in to Europe and Asia, they encountered Neanderthals. And we don't know what happened to the Neanderthals, but the whole research about them is really showing that they were much more sophisticated people. In fact, some people are arguing that maybe they actually belong to our same species. But in any case, a bunch of wily folks started heading across into what's called the Mammoth Steppe, which was this wonderful hunting, hunting environment with big game. And they walk across all the way into North America. Now, at the time of the Ice Age, this was called the Bering Strait, and because these continental glaciers had locked up so much ice, it was open landscape, and people hunted across it. They didn't have, you know, we're not going to North America. They didn't know where they were going, except they were following game animals and hunting, and when um, places would be depleted, um, they would move on. And so they crossed over, and when they got to um, interior Alaska, they looked up, and there was this mile high, or two mile high, actually, glacier called the Cordilleran, which basically buried the mountains of British Columbia all the way up. And so what did they do? A lot of, for a lot of years, people thought they hung out in Beringia until this ice-free corridor opened between the Cordilleran ice sheet and this big, massive Laurentide ice sheet that covered most of the United States, and they wandered down. And those people were called the Clovis people. Um, so they waited and waited and wandered down through. But we began to find sites that were earlier than Clovis people, earlier than 13,500 years ago. And it became, after a fierce, fierce academic debate, accepted that these early groups probably floated down on umiaks, or boats that are still used today, and they sailed down past this enormous, enormous glacier, and there were islands along the way that they could stop at. And by the time they got to, oh, kind of the Canadian Washington border, the Cordilleran had sort of receded and the coastal plain, which would be largely exposed because, again, these ice sheets had sucked up so much water, and they disembarked and headed on their journey to populate the United States. I always get this question. I give this class um, to a lot of kids. The most entertaining group are fourth and fifth graders. I <laughs> love, I literally, I love to teach them. And honestly, they ask the best questions. And the one question is, well, Mr. Davis, what do these sites look like? I mean, what do they look like? So I'm showing you this slide because I stuck it in for fourth graders. <laughs> but this is an early site. This is a pre-Clovis site that I happen to work on in Pennsylvania called Meadowcroft Rock Shelter. This was ground central for the fierce debate about whether people were here earlier than the Clovis people. Um, the guy that dug this was a fierce advocate for that, very intimidating, but it was not accepted. Then they dug a site in Chile called Monte Verde, and lo and behold, it was in peat moss and this wonderful preservation. So you could see not only just stone tools and little bits of bone, but um, evidence of structures, cordage, and so on. And Basically, at Monte Verde, at Monte Verde, it became accepted that people were here before Clovis by 14,500 years ago. And then, lo and behold, right across the hill on the Salmon River in Idaho, one of the most fascinating excavations going on at Cooper's Ferry, and they dug up an Indian site that dates about 16,000 years ago. So now we know that indigenous peoples were here 
a lot earlier than the Clovis people. So we were all feeling good. This battle about pre-Clovis had been won. And then, you've heard this in the news. So now, at White Sands, and people have known about these tracks since the 1930s, but archaeologists started excavating them. And they are in an old lake bed, and kids and adults walked, and big animals, um, all kinds of Pleistocene animals in this old lake shore. And they dated the, basically it's ditch grass, the seeds that were embedded in the squish between the toes and the tracks and up and below, and they came up with these dates. <laughs> um, but so there was enormous outcry. This can't, because this is getting to right near what was called the late, uh, last or late glacial maximum when it was really, really cold. Well, what happened is, and this is kind of interesting, this got cut up and, uh, caught up in COVID because this is a national park. They couldn't do any field work. And the gal that was excavating it said, I always intended to go back and do other kinds of dating. And she bided her time, went back in, and they've dated pine seeds, which, uh, and the reason the dates were questionable is because it's um, grass in the marsh, it can be a carbon reservoir and have lots of old carbon that would make the dates older. But what they found with the pine pollen is it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a reservoir. And they also did this thing called um, optical stimulate uh, luminescence, which basically dates the last time quartz crystals were exposed to sunlight. And lo and behold, all three of those dating came into about 21 to 23. So we know people were well south of the ice sheets a long time before um, Clovis and certainly people that lived at Meadowcroft. And what does that translate to 920 generations? Of course, my tribal friends go, God, you guys are digging all this stuff. Just, just come and ask us. We could have told you. <laughs> Saved a lot of time and money. So anyway. I, won't, I could talk forever about the Pleistocene, but we need to move on. So, Oh, but wait, what about Lake Missoula? For a long time, I was in undergraduate school in the early 70s, and the professors were, no, no, you know, maybe possibly Clovis people would have seen the last time that the lake was filled. And there was always the joke about, you know, being camped down somewhere in the Columbia, and you hear, Joe, what's that big roar coming from upriver? <laughs> but that was about the size of it. But in fact, you've seen the evidence, these older dates, so surely people saw Glacial Lake Missoula. Now, Glacial Lake Missoula filled up, and then the ice dam that was holding it near Sandpoint, Idaho, burst, and it carved up the Columbia Plateau, and then it would refill. So it was probably a place you didn't hang out very much. But um, you know we do know, we can infer that people certainly saw these glacial lakes. And there's Glacial Lake, Great Falls, a Glacial Lake Cut Bank, and there's all of these big lakes at, in the front of these massive, massive ice sheets. So it's kind of a cool thing. Now graduate students, um, way back when, have looked at a lot of these ridges. It's a massive project, but you know nothing has turned up. But maybe on one of these high ridges, uh, a really old site will eventually turn up. But that's a lot of work. And archaeology in Montana, uh, Western Montana, is uh, hard to do. Okay. So real quick, who are these people in Montana that we have? We do not have a 16,000-year-old site yet. We don't have a 23,000-old site. But we do have a Clovis site. And you probably heard about the Anzic site, which is a child's burial down near Livingston, Montana. It was pot hunted, but archaeologists were able to, to come in and do some work. And what's significant is the child dates to about 13,000, I don't know, 200 years ago. But with the consent of tribes, they've done genetic testing. And its ancestry is clearly East Asian. So this is proof in the pudding that they came across the Bering Strait from Eurasia a long time ago. 
If you go to the historical society, there's a wonderful exhibit of these tools, which were funerary items that were apparently going to accompany this young uh, Clovis child into the afterlife, where in the afterlife there were surely big uh, woolly beasts too to be contended with. A little later in time, still under Ice Age conditions, is the Mill Iron site, which is down near Ekalaka. You can't really visit it, it's just a big sagebrush flat. But they did uncover, um, and we'll talk a little more about this later, but um, where about 30, uh, 33 bison, uh, bison um, antiquus were, um, on some fine spring day, they were lured into a draw and uh, ambushed. And, and butchered, and it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty cool site, an important one. And you know, this doesn't do justice to the size of these beasts, these ancient uh, bison antiquus. I mean, had big, enormous, enormous horns and stuff. You know, the, and these guys are, and gals are out there, and I mean gals too, are out hunting these things with nothing but spears and atlatls. Okay, but all things Pleistocene come to an end and we enter about 11,000 years ago into the Holocene. And this doesn't happen overnight and there's a little cold blip that happens. Um, but basically the landscape was profoundly changed. Not only did the ice at northern latitudes go away, but the vegetation changed. Um, and so people had all kinds of new opportunities for hunting and gathering. And again, these are hunting and gathering peoples. But um, it took, there was a process of ad adaptation and learning. You can see the ice receding. Okay. And so what is really significant is uh, in cold weather climates, these people, um, and we don't know whose ancestry they were, but they were surely Assiniboine, Blackfeet, you know, just take your pick. I mean, this large pool of indigenous people that were out there. But um, what it, these people were expert in Ice Age environments at procuring um, uh, plant foods and so on. There's always this image uh, perpetuated by male archaeologists um, that it's all about hunting and you know, going out and knocking something down and bringing it home for dinner. But really, what we do know is that women hunted. They may have been more effective hunters than men. Um, but they also, uh, there was a whole gathering component. And um, we didn't really see that in the archaeological record early on because we didn't have the methods that we have today, like pollen analysis and recovery techniques. But there's a site near um, Sheridan, Montana called Bart Gulch. And again, you can drive there. All you look and see is old mill tailings and or, uh, waste rock and uh, a sagebrush flat. But it's a, it was a processing plant for uh, plants, basically, and very elaborate, where they were cooking up bitter root, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, pickle. Prickly. Yeah, <laughs> prickly pear and uh, 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 goosefoot, and by an elaborate process. And we begin to see some grinding slabs. And we, these aren't the grinding slabs that you see in the Southwest, where people are in the industrial production of corn, making cornmeal. They're very, um, they're just very rubbed slightly on the surface, but we know because we do testing, and now we can do DNA testing on the residues that these people were uh, um, grinding up all kinds of things to make powder, and then that powder could be made into kind of like a flour in a stew, or it could be made into patties that would be dried and carried in your bag. So this is a really important thing, and it really got hot. This is called the uh, altothermal and for whatever reason, temperatures seem to peak about 9,000 years ago. So life, um, you know, there was a 3,000 year kind of spread when the ice age conditions went away and the environment got hotter and hotter. And it may be a little bit like the global warming we're experiencing now, where we find the population densities dropped. Um, we find people moving into really um, safe basins where there were lots of water and so on. So, you know, even though it's the Pleistocene, the Holocene, and we kind of think the Holocene should just go like this, well, the Holocene has always gone like this. But 9,000 years ago, it got really hot. And then it began to cool down, okay? <laughs> 
And so people used all kinds of things for shelter. Again, these are nomadic peoples, ancestral, again, um, take your pick, Shoshone, um, these different um, peoples that still are very much with us today. Rock shelters and caves were used widely both as campsites but also as stopovers. Again, this is Pictograph Cave, and if you've never been there, it's really worth your time. Um, during the Alta Thermal, they actually <coughs> built what we call pit houses, and we don't have very many in Montana. There's a site near Pryor, but there are lots of them in Wyoming. And the reason there are lots of them in Wyoming is because coal development has required very, very extensive archaeological work, and so we know a lot about this because of that. Um, Two pet projects of mine, they're all kinds of wood structures. These are called wickiups or conical lodges, and they were used for all kinds of different things. Um, and these things are all disappearing because of their fragility, but also because of wildfires or just, you know, Yellowstone Park used to have quite a few, and then the big blowout in 88 in particular took out a bunch. And they also made what are called crib log structures, you know, big big, basically primitive, but houses that you could get inside and weather. Weather the weather. The last thing, of course, that everybody knows is teepees. And teepees became into widespread use surprisingly about 3,500 years ago. We're not really sure. You know, I'm sure that these people had portable um, skin structures, pole structures. But by 3,500 years ago, we began to see you know, these circles of stone that were used to hold, kind of hold down the hides. Hides were, teepees were staked down, but then they put additional rocks because you could lift up a piece of the hide on your teepee and let the air flow through, and then when you decided it was getting cold, you could drop it down and drop a rock on it. And so there's teepee rings all over Montana. Um, they're by the thousands and thousands, particularly up on the high line. And why are they so dense up on the high line? Well, that's bison country, and that's where people really flock to. Okay? Of course, Montana has always been a hunter's paradise. And again, these the indigenous peoples of uh, various ethnicities um, hunted them in lots of ways. These guys didn't go out and try and get a, you know, a five-horn buck or whatever and throw it in their pickup and go home. Um, you know, they didn't have time for that kind of nonsense. So what they did is they did all kinds of techniques to kill them in mass. And this is a mountain sheep trap near Dillon where they ran sheep into this pen and then they went in with clubs and bopped them over the head. There are all kinds of drive. This is a drive lane, a project I'm involved with in Dillon where they're running them alongside probably antelope and mountain sheep. And, nailing them. Um, there are all kinds of hunting blinds. So again, their hunting strategies were for mass production. And that's not to say people didn't go out and hunt on their own and bring back game. But there were what we call a lot of communal hunting techniques. For a really long time, people used the atlatl, which is a spear thrower. Basically, it's a stick with a knob on the end. And you lay the arrow shaft. And you throw it, and it gives you an additional elbow. It's just like the dog when you throw the ball with the dog. It's at the very same principle. And these things were used from at least 17,000 years ago till almost to the historic times. The bow and arrow seems to have been popularized on the plains about 1,500 years ago. And people talk about these little bird points. They must have been used for, you no, know, those are arrow points that go on arrowheads. It's a different kind of technology. Okay. Of course, what was really important is bison, real meat. And they were hunted throughout time. If you remember um, the mill iron site where they were hunting fossil forms of bison or ancient bison. Um, this is a jump near Dillon where they ran them off this cliff and butchered. And there's a camp over here. Um, and when the horse came into widespread use, when it was uh, began to um, be traded to Northern Plains tribes. Then a lot of these old trapping methods uh, went away, and they um, began to run into bison herds with buffalo chargers, highly trained horses, and run up to the side. And these horses were tr just like a good uh, steer um, 
course when you're doing steer wrestling and your haze comes up like this and you get off your horse and then you pull back quickly because that steer is going to go like this. And so hunting bison, they would ride up like this and they'd go right up next to them and just went and then the horse would just bolt that way. They were that well trained. And they were so well trained that the horse rating was just huge all over the place. But it became a fine art on the plains. And people were after these buffalo runners, these fine horses. I could dwell on hunting bison all day long and I put you guys to sleep uh, if you're not already. But I would say, you know, we have lots of bison jumps around. Um, you can go see the Madison Buffalo Jump. If you haven't been to First Peoples, it's really a stop worth taking. And then there's a Wapachugan, which is outside of Haver, in really the heart of really big bison hunting country near, um, it's kind of on, near a shopping mall outside of uh, Haver. But those are the few of these things. The one thing that we get is that everybody was bison um, running these things off cliffs. Well, that's a really, really dangerous enterprise. And what actually people did was try and run them into actually corrals. And there are all kinds of wood corrals uh, that we know about, both archaeologically and certainly from tribal people. And that was a far safer way to go. And bison can be surprisingly manipulated. So we sometimes think it's all about this big drama of bison jumping and running off the cliffs. But actually, they were running them into these corrals in a variety of different ways to kill bison. OK. And um, you know, in archaeology in Montana, because it's such a harsh climate, um, unlike the Great Basin, we don't have the preservation of material culture that you have in many regions. And so basically, all we have to work with or much is the stone tools that were made or for, as tools or the stone tools that were made to make other tools. And so it's a little bit of a fool's errand because you have just so small of a material culture to work with. But um, nonetheless, it provides some information about how tools were made. We often think of these guys just walking along, well, that's a nice rock. And they pick it up and put it in their bag and go home. But actually, it was a science because you have to get the right kind of chippable raw material, flints and chirts and obsidian to make tools. And you'd go to a quarry like this guy at the Schmidt site near um, Three Forks. And they made these big tools called bifaces, which were just worked on both sides. And you'd put it in the bag. And that was tool stock for the year. And the reason they did that is they didn't want to take a bunch of chunks home. And the first time they hit it, it would all explode. You know, they, so they would go to places. This is called South Everson Creek. And it looks like miners' pits. And archaeologists for years just walked right by them. But actually, um, these are big, big quarries where they're digging up chert with bone tools and probably some wood tools to pry out these big chunks of rock. So quarries can be absolutely massive. Of course, this is the most famous one is uh, obsidian cliffs that you can drive by. And obsidian cliffs, obsidian was widely traded. They find it in sites in Delaware. So it was traded all over in the southwest. Um, there's a, a humongous quarry um, on the Montana-Idaho border called um, Bear Gulch, which is actually more widely used than, um, uh, than the obsidian cliffs. The interesting thing, you can do x-ray fluorescence and identify the point source where the material was quarried. So that allows you to trace the movement of this rock, either through exchange or actual movement of people. And if you have never seen a flint wrapper and uh, happer work, they're really fun to watch. Um, the, it's, it's, it's an art. And everybody in this room's ancestors knew how to do. Oh. Sorry, I got to No, that's OK. That's OK. <laughs> knew how to pound rock. <laughs> the other thing that is a real common feature of, of Montana archaeology is rock art. And these are paintings and etchings on cliffs. And honestly, for a long time, archaeologists thought it was kind of indecipherable. And tribal people were glad, because that just kept archaeologists away from fiddling with this stuff, because these are highly sacred places to indigenous peoples around the world. Um, but sort of working carefully with tribal people, 
um, these different kinds of rock art sites have been um, <laughs> recorded and tried to preserve. People, I don't know why, but like people shoot at anything, but you know, these things become popular targets for people with rifles and guns and everything else. But they had, all rock art was not used for the same purpose. Rock art was used to mark warrior deeds, and this is a site called Bear Gulch, which you can visit near Lewistown, and it was a special place that warriors could celebrate um, their deeds in combat, and what you see are these big shields, and what's great about these big shields is they identify particular ethnic groups, and so we know that these are particularly Cheyenne shields or Sioux shields or so on. So, you know, this is a really important. Um, people went on vision quests to procure a vision in life, and that would require fasting and so on, and oftentimes you would mark your um, vision on a surface, scratch it or paint it. Um, and then, I don't have a good depiction, but in late times, people be began to actually carve um, very vivid combat scenes on the rock art. And by then, um, you know, it's very definitely clear which ethnic group is after what ethnic group in these different uh, scenes of combat. So, rock art seems to most of us, it's kind of like, wow, it's red designs on the wall, what it means. But really, this has become a very specialized and focused field of archaeology. Okay. So, we've been kind of talking in a vacuum because really there was so much more going on in the world around them. And um, there was this little place called Cahokia, which wasn't a little place at all a thousand years ago. It was a bona fide Native American village um, city. And uh, it's near uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And there were other places like that throughout the southeast. And these people depended and grew corn and crops and so on. And, um, and that ultimately the source of some of this was out of northern Mexico and the high civilizations of Mexico. So if you're out on the plains and you're still camped out somewhere in the Marias, you definitely know that there's a big city over there someplace. And if there's one thing about Native American people or indigenous people, they get up and go. They would walk all of us into the face of the earth. And so these guys would walk and visit, travel to visit these villages. So what happens is this idea of farming and agriculture moves up into the North Dakotas and into the ancestral uh, Mandan and Arikara um, and other indigenous peoples. And it even trickles out onto the plains. And a place called Cl uh, Glendive, a place called the Hagen site, we find a farming village in Montana. And it didn't last real long. It lasted three or four hundred years. And for maybe it was weather, difficulty of crops, but it was probably the ancestral crow who became the mountain crow, they picked up and moved to the bighorns and abandoned this farming way of life for the buffalo chase and to find sacred tobacco and so on. And there are several others. So I've been talking about hunters and gatherers, but um, there are also settled villages, uh, not cities, but major villages, a few in Montana, okay? But of course, this is the story that becomes familiar to everybody. This is when we have first encounters with um, uh, Europeans, and um, that radically changes the ways of life of native peoples. Initially, a lot of those encounters, at least on the plains, were peaceful. We'll help you if you help us. Um, but eventually, it led to um, warfare and, um, and all the rest. Um, I think there's over 300 treaties that were made with indigenous groups, and every one of them was broken. And so that, um, that led to the Battle of Little Bighorn, Rosebud, um, and so on, trying to keep these people on reservations. Um, there's one site in Montana called, um, well, there's a bunch of sites. There was a group of people that you might have heard, the Sheep Eater Shoshone. And they were a Shoshonean group that were basically part of uh, Chicago Wea's bunch, but they lived up in the mountains in southwestern Montana in Yellowstone Park. And they tried to avoid the hunters and trappers for as long as they could, but eventually they were put on reservations uh, at Fort Hall and Fort Washakie too. <clears throat> 
So it's an interesting period. This is, I think, for most of our educational careers, this is the story that we pick up, and I don't need to dwell on it here, except that archaeologists and native peoples working with archaeologists or archaeologists working with native peoples, however, are interested in this period. It's a tough, challenging one because so much went on, but it's an important one. Okay, almost there. And then finally, um, you know, in terms of the story of, of indigenous peoples, uh, peoples were moved on different reservations in Montana. Um, archaeologists actually have worked with the consent of tribes or at the wish of tribes to excavate and preserve several of the older Crow reservations that um, were established until everybody was moved to Harden. This is a wonderful project near Absarca uh, in south central Montana where it's being excavated um, at this old, old um, reservation or agency headquarters. And not surprisingly, they found um, where um, European or Euro-American people were living and what they depended on for diet. Native people weren't having any of that. And so you can see just profound difference in material culture. What you can also see is items of, of modern or historic peoples were made into something different like glass. Oh, here's a nice glass. Fine, I can make that into a ice scraper. You know, it just works like obsidian. So we see a lot of this, and at some point, I hope the book comes out about this because it'll be a really cool thing. Okay, last one. So finally, um, as I said, there's seven reservations in Montana. Again, you are all familiar with this story. Different indigenous groups were moved together, sometimes indigenous peoples that did not a lot get along, um, can, having competed for territory and resources for many, many years. One thing I like to stress, though, is that these reservations, at least some of them, are the last remnants of this vast country that they thought was their homeland. So I think we sometimes think of reserves as like sending them away off someplace <coughs> distance. But in Montana, for some cases, these are just the last, um, the last residual places that people have. Now, it's true, the Eastern Indians got moved to Oklahoma, and then oil got struck. Mm -hmm. and if you've watched Killers of the Flowery Moon, that is a great story about that. And of course, the, um, uh, the Salish got moved out of the Bitterroot Valley and the Plains only to go to Flathead Lake, which is um, now where all uh, people go to recreation. And there's lots of money and wealth, so the irony is a little bit rich sometimes. Um, the Cree are the last group. They have been federally recognized, so potentially we will see another, some kind of a reservation carved out. Last thing is that people like myself and other archaeologists and cultural people and tribal people, um, we work with tribal people to try and identify places that are still important. And to them, that they still use these places in contemporary times. And it's really cherry picking because as uh, Black Elk's wonderful thing is, you know, how do you pick? Everything is important. We love this whole place. But there are places like Badger Two Medicine where in fact it's a really focus of concerted uh, Native American religion, cultural practices, and through federal laws, these places can be designated for their contemporary cultural values. Obviously the Sweetgrass Hills are other places. Now that doesn't mean, just like any site that's designated a historic site, that doesn't mean nothing can happen there. It just means that those values need to be considered as the Forest Service, the BLM, or whatever does their thing. The Pryor Mountains are another really important. The Pryor Mountains, if you walk the rim, it's got thousands of fasting beds where people had visions. Um, the Crazy Mountains, actually, the crazies have fasting beds that actually plenty who fasted on. So, you know, they're, they're real tangible places to tribal people that we're working with tribes to at least to protect as best we can. Um, and lastly, you know, tribal people are really um, becoming a really strong force in cultural resource management as they should. Um, and I think that it's been a long, long time in coming. You know, at some point, I hope somebody that uh, lives 
in Blackfoot country or a Salish person would be giving this same talk, but talking about it in a whole different way from a whole different point of view. And if we ever get to that point, I think at least my job is done. So with that, I'll open it to questions. Yeah. Where is the pictograph cave that you were talking about? It's um, just outside of Billings, um, Montana. And it's just literally, I think, seven miles outside of town, kind of south of town. Yeah. I was wondering, because you went from the Clovis to the different American Indian sites, is there archaeology that looks at that progression from along the line from the Clovis to what they were more like physiologically to the American Indians or you know what I mean? There's not a lot of Native American burials. I mean, there have been some. Um, the, the archaeologists have a, a horrible history of working with skeletal material and locking it away in museums. And there's a repatriation, federal repatriation act, and that you know a lot of those skeletal remains are being returned and repatriated. But the skeletal remains of that far back are few and far between. Anzic is um, a really an exception to the rule. So we can't really physically see you know, what, what that transition might be, if there would be any. And the Anzic child has been reburied, repatriated out on that property. So the only way archaeologists really try and get at it is technology. But I always look at it this way. So those first pre-Clovis people that might go back as far as 23,000 years, these people were the pioneers. And so when they came in, they had a diverse kind of material culture at that, you know, adapting to their circumstances like American pioneers or pioneers any place in the world that move into new territory. But archaeologists have always wanted this cooker cookie cutter. These are the Clovis points because of people because they made this particular thing. But I think when people began to settle in, then those pioneers became settlers, began changing ideas, and all of a sudden the idea of the Clovis point, yeah, this is a great way to make a point. You know, even it could be a completely separate ethnic group, but that idea of making a point a certain way becomes sort of what we call a horizon. And so that's what archaeologists kind of study, but sad, you know, sadly, we don't do a lot of genetic research. The Blackfeet, however, they've been doing a great project up uh, for years now with a woman that's at the University of Arizona. And they recently did, were allowed to do genetic testing. And what they determined, there was a long standing idea that the Blackfeet were fairly recent migrants onto the plains. And recent, we're talking several thousand years or more. But they, were associated with what's called the black duck culture in Minnesota, rice. They lived on rice and wild game, and they decided to move out onto the plain. But this genetic testing that they have done shows that the Blackfeet have probably been on the plains of Montana for 10,000 years. So, you know, that really, so genetic testing, when we can do it, can profoundly change, you know, what archaeologists think about the past. You, you dwelt, with, uh, dwelt on uh, North America. Yeah. Did these tribes or people migrate down the peninsula of Mexico and uh, into South America? Yeah, you know, on that one slide. So um, they just kept boogieing, and there's a site at the very end of uh, South America called Fell's Cave, and they were there by 11 or 12,000 years ago. And they're the same indigenous populations that are moving down through. Well, I have read from time to time that some indication that maybe Polynesians had uh, uh, sailed across through South America. Now, is that a uh, hypothesis that's sort of been put to rest or is no longer applicable? I think at one time it was put to rest because the material culture didn't necessarily you know, support that. But I think it's a little more open book now with genetic testing. And South American indigenous populations are more open to that. And what we do find is that people moved in. 
and then they came back north. Oh, this isn't working. You know, they went to the Sonoran Desert and decided to get the hell out of there. You know, we go down there to Snowbird. I'd love to be in the Sonoran Desert right now, but I wouldn't want to live there. And so what they're finding is that, you know, it wasn't this kind of this people on the march and, okay, now we're going to settle here and somebody else. You know, it was very, very fluid and people would go down and move back and so on. And again, if we had more genetic data, the archaeological record is really hard to interpret that kind of stuff with. Yeah. Are there ideas about the driving forces of the climate changes that happen from the, between the cold and the warm periods and back and forth? What, what drove those climate changes? Again, um, there were lots of different things. The, the primary drivers, they're called the Milankovitch cycles. And they occur one, every 100 plus, every 40, and every 20,000 years. And one cycle has to do with the precession around the sun. And we don't go in a straight round circle, it's an oblong. And when we're way out at the end here, at that 100,000 year, things get chilly. And then you combine that with the tilt on the axis, and all of a sudden the axis is tilted away from the sun then that allows snowfall to accumulate and create these massive ice sheets. And then when you kind of come around and by the time you're closest to the sun, you're in a warm or interglacial period. So that's a real driver of climate change. But there's also sunspots, volcanoes, of course, volcanic activity, um, ocean currents, and so on. The scary thing, you know, if, what is the importance of learning any of this? Um, you know, one lesson is, is that we were well on our way to the Holocene about 12,000, well, 13,000 years ago, and um, the climate was slowly warming. But because there was so much glacial ice that melted and flooded into the North Atlantic, it slowed down the North Atlantic current to a slug. And for about a thousand years, there was a massive cold snap. Well, this is a very big concern today because that North Atlantic current swoops around, it goes down to southern oceans, brings up warm water up along the coast of Africa and up in it by Europe, and it keeps that climate mild because it shouldn't be that mild. I mean, it's at the latitude of Boston and New Brunswick and so on. But it's because this warming, this massive warmth, and then it crosses the North Atlantic, and then the salt cold water pushes that warmed all water, and it goes swooping down, and as much colder water, which is why that's one of the Cape Cod is the one of the world's the world's greatest cod fisheries, because there was so much cold water, swoops its way around and it cycles back. Well, with global warming as the ice melts, um, you know, there is some concern about slowing down that North Atlantic current. And the real kicker is we were always thinking about it being the northern ice sheet, but it's the southern ice sheet that seems to be a big concern to climate scientists now, that these are calving off and pouring all this cold water into the ocean currents. So it's interesting. What is the name of that cycle? Yeah. It's called the Milankovitch. You should read about this guy. So he did this mathematically. He was back in the turn of the century. He had all kinds of, I think he escaped czarist Russia. And, you know, I mean, just this dramatic life. But he was a mathematician. And he calibrated over years that these cycles. So what archaeologists do is they do pollen cores or ice cores or sea sediment cores. And there's a very different ways that they can see climate in those cores. And those cores matched up both the sea sediment cores to, and the ice cores almost one to one to the Milankovitch cycles. So again, in that science, that's where you have convergence. You know, you're building, building a rope. You just don't have a single thread, but you're putting multiple strands together. Yeah. Um, I was wondering um, why the uh, Home Piskin buffalo jump wasn't included. I, I was told that it was one of the more popular buffalo jumps in that 
Try it from all the way over here to Blackbeak to Crow, all consolidated and like set up like piecing to hunt together at certain times of the year to go to that big buffalo jump and work together to harvest the buffalo. Yeah, you know, I think that, you know, native peoples. Um, we're in various alliances and agreements. It was good for the order to, you know, to befriend uh, other groups and work together. And they were, for whatever reason, that jump is, uh, you know, was really very productive. It's also to the Blackfeet, to the Shoshone, it's got extreme religious value. Um, and I can't tell you what it is, I don't know, but I've just been told by Blackfeet friends and Shoshone friends it does. Um, but, you know, we think about that as being so rich and productive. But there's another site called the Highwood site where they, archaeologists estimated that there were 250,000 bison run off that. So, um, you know, and I think that would be another cooperative adventure where people would agree that let's, because it's a big operation. Someday, I've, well, I'll do this one last thing. So on a hunt, um, you know, the, it was very well organized. And so you would be in a camp and you would be waiting for bison to arrive. You would have shamans that were trying to call the bison in. And they would send out scouts or wolves to watch the bison. The scouts would often, and this could take a week, two weeks, they would appear on a ridge and spook the bison a little bit and they'd move over. And the scouts would report back to the hunt chief or the hunt chiefs about the status. They would often go out at that time and build rock alignments or drive lanes so that they could run these bison in this funnel to this point. Oftentimes they would build a corral down at the base of a jump or sometimes they would just build a corral without the jump. And then when they got the bison close enough, people were assigned tasks. They would move the camp away or at least it was all fires out kids in the teepees, dogs, we don't need dogs messing up things. What they really didn't need is ambitious young warriors wanting to go out and prove their mettle. And if you did that and you scared off the bison, the, the punishment could be meted out anything from fairly severe lashings and so on to burning down your teepee. So, you know, everybody is in a survival mode. They the wolves come in and say, we're ready, we're going to start working these things. And they go out, and I mean wolves, young men, and they're dressed in wolf capes. And they go out and start moving in the catchment base and funneling these bison nice and slow. People kind of go up behind these rock cairns, and they sometimes are standing there, sometimes they're hunkered down with bison robe over their head. And they keep working them into this V-shaped funnel that can take up a large part of a prairie, like the ones I've worked on in Dillon, you know, they're not that big as they are in the highland. And then at the last minute, they give them a big push. But what often happens is a buffalo runner, two brave, brave young men or women dressed in a, like a bison calf, starts bleeding as in, and start panicking. And mama cows and mama bison start being concerned about that. And they start going over, and these guys start running, or gals start running. And then all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose as they get them into this funnel. And then they begin to stand up as they get them close to the jump and wave robes and pray to God that one of those things doesn't head your way. And then off they go. And then they immediately start butchering. And, you know, there's lots of bison fall over the top of each other, and many of them aren't killed. It was very important to kill the last bison that was in the mayhem because they didn't want that bison to go off and tell their bison brother and sisters that this was a really bad place to hang out. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's not as simple as it, you know, it's, it's very complicated, very well planned, very much guided by people that knew what the hell was going on. And also there was no doubt fatalities. So that's why if they could build something on the ground, a corral, because you can move bison into corral and you can do them with cottonwood branches and stuff. And if you put um, bison robes over the top, you can 
final buys and in, and for some reason they don't want to bust out. And if you've ever worked cattle, that's kind of amazing to me, but they tend to mill and run around, and then guys can get up with their and gals with their addle addles or spears and knock them dead, and you have a more span of control than this very dramatic bison jumping. And so pounds are called pounds or corrals were used widely, but there's very little archaeological evidence of them. Yeah. You mentioned North Atlantic ice sheet. Uh, there are archaeologists that propose that native cultures from Europe came to the east coast of North America before the west coast. That's a, that's a, where is that at in the research? <laughs> wow, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, yeah, so there's the idea, well, if the ice sheets have locked up all this land, you could sure as heck walk on the continental shelf in Europe and walk across. You'd have the precarious North Atlantic, but a lot of that were big ice sheets. So why couldn't these early populations, sophisticated populations, um, hunter-gatherers, um, move across and the same way that we think they did from the East Coast. And there was an arch two archaeologists, great archaeologists, that proposed that. And there's a particular kind of projectile point in France and Northern Europe that looks a lot like what might be manufactured here. But that has largely been dispelled because of the genetic information that we have, that it seems like that Eurasian ancestry is, um, is where these people came from. But, you know, that was a very, and continues to be a really relevant archaeological question. One last one. Hey, um, I'm actually Chippewa Cree, so I know uh, Rocky was a reservation. So we're the only Cree from Canada that came down. Chief Little Bear. And Chief Rocky Boy is Chippewa. They kind of got it together, that's why it's called Rocky Boy, it's Chippewa Cree. One thing in the middle where you see Cree just got recognized as the actual Chippewa. Chippewa. Uh -oh. Yeah, they are outside of Great Falls now. They have a Hill 57. So there is eight tribes now. Thank you. Any other? One last one. Okay. I know you guys are anxious to head. We like questions. We like questions. What's that? Are there interesting sites to do around Missoula? You know, um, like I say, I, I think there are. The, the problem in western Montana is a lot of where the archaeology is done is on mountain slopes where Forest Service projects and stuff. And so there hasn't been a ton of archaeology done adjacent to the Clark Fork or adjacent to Thompson or whatever river. And so, at least in my understanding, we don't know a lot about the archaeology. We do know that back in the 40s and 50s, uh, there were several collectors from uh, Thompson Falls and places like that that amassed enormous collections of pestles and grinding stones and all kinds of things and they would get permission or not to go in plowed fields. So um, I think the record is there but um, you know archaeologists don't have as much access to it. You know that's why you know archaeologists love working on the east side of the divide uh, in the sense that there isn't as much soil buildup and deposition and a lot of the archaeology is out there fairly visible. But in western Montana you have soil buildup, you've got all this darn duff and you know it's hard to see and again a lot of the federal and even state work that's been done has been, I mean they find lots of mining sites and cabins and stuff but and peel trees so there's a lot of that but not so much a lot of really hardcore dirt archaeology. Well, thank you guys very much. Go ahead.